Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you at Harvard. Well, let me start off, if I may, on a somber note. I hope it'll end up being a liberating reflection uh, by the end of the morning. When Chancellor Merkel became Chancellor of Germany, she asked me to come to Berlin in the first few weeks of her new administration to help her address the question, how do we grow the German economy in the 21st century? Now, no small business, because remember, the German economy is the most robust industrial economy per capita in the world, and along with China, the leading exporting nation on the planet. When I got to Berlin, the first question I asked the Chancellor is, Madam Chancellor, how do we grow the German economy, the European Union economy, the global economy, in the last stages of a great energy era? We've had two events in the last three and a half years that I believe signaled the beginning of an end game, a torturous end game for the great industrial revolutions based on fossil fuels. The first event, July 2008, let's take everybody back here to that month, if you recall. Brent crude oil hit $147 a barrel on world markets. And the prices across the supply chain went through the roof. And that's because everything in this global economy is made out of or moved by fossil fuels. Excuse me, you'll have to take the camera in the back room. I'm used to a quiet classroom, sorry. Okay, just move it in the back, thank you. We grow our food in petrochemical fertilizers and pesticides. Virtually all of our construction materials from plastic to cement are made out of fossil fuels. Most of our pharmaceutical products are still petrochemical based all of our synthetic fiber, our power, transport, heat, and light. We've built a great short-lived civilization on digging up the burial deposits of the Carboniferous era. So when oil started to go over $80 a barrel in 2007, all the other prices in the supply chain went up. At $120 a barrel, we had food riots in 22 countries, and that's because, as you know, 40% of the human race lives on $2 a day or less. And the price of rice, wheat, barley, rye was doubling and trebling because of the oil markets. And the United Nations FAO put out an alert saying, we have a billion people now in harm's way. This was a serious crisis. At $147 a barrel, the prices for everything were so high, all of us stopped buying. And the entire economic engine of the Industrial Revolution shut down that month. What I want to suggest to you, that was the economic earthquake. The collapse of the financial market 60 days later was the aftershock. In public policy, we're still dealing with the aftershock, including many of my colleagues, all, most of the economists. We're not dealing with the earthquake. And until we do, we're not going to get a read on where we are and where we need to go. The connection between the oil crisis and the financial collapse, I'm not going to deal with that this morning. It is a long chapter, chapter one in the book, The Third Industrial Revolution. But the reason, what's happened here is we've hit peak globalization for the second industrial revolution. In the business community, we now know the outer limits of how far we can globalize this economy. It's about 150 a barrel, and it'll shut down every time. The reason is we've hit two milestones. Peak oil per capita, 1979, and now global peak oil production in 2006. Peak oil per capita happened at the height of the Second Industrial Revolution. Had we distributed all the crude oil we had in 1979 to everyone alive at that moment on the planet, that's the most each person could have if we shared it. We have found more oil since then, but population rose quicker. So if we distributed all the crude oil we have today to 7 billion people, there's just less to go around. The second milestone, Global peak oil production, which, as you know, has been rather controversial among geologists for the last 20 years. That's when we use half the oil in the world on the Hubert Bell curve in geology. The interesting point of this is when half the oil is used up, it's over because we can't afford the second half. It's prohibitive price-wise. The International Energy Agency, who all of us rely on for our stats for fossil fuels, they dropped a bombshell in the business community in, Decem in December 2010 and they issued their 2011 energy report, and they said, it looks like we peaked in 2006. 
at 70 million barrels of crude oil a day. We'll plateau down to 69 million barrels over the next 20 years. But listen to this. It's going to cost us $7 trillion to $8 trillion to get that remaining oil out. So when India and China made a bid to bring one-third of the human race into the game at a fast-paced 8, 10, 12 percent growth rate in the last 15 years, the aggregate demand pressure against crude oil was so great, all the other prices went up after the oil prices went up, and then we shut down in July 2008. This is an end game. This is peak globalization. What I'm suggesting to you, every time we try to regrow this global economy at the same rate we are growing before 2008, we're going to see the same cycle. Oil goes up, all the other prices go up, purchasing power shuts down. That's what's happened. In 2009, oil was hitting about 30 a barrel because there was no economic activity. So oil was just paced very low. As soon as we tried to replenish inventories in 2010, oil prices have shot up. All the other prices have gone up, and purchasing power is slowing down all over the world today. And here in the United States, everyone says we have a glimmer of the economy moving. The economy is moving, but watch the gasoline prices go to 4 to $5 a barrel in the next 12 months. This is an end game. Every time we try to restart the engine, four to five year cycles, collapse. Restart the engine, four to five year cycles, collapse. Maybe six years. This is a dangerous moment in economic history. It's also a great opportunity. The second event in the last three and a half years, Copenhagen. Leaders come together from 192 countries to address the entropy bill for the industrial age. Do I have any engineers here? Well, you know you cannot escape that second law of thermodynamics. This is not a metaphor. We have burned massive amounts of coal, oil, and natural gas in the first and second industrial revolutions. And now we simply have too much industrial-induced CO2 into the atmosphere. And I might say industrial-induced methane, watch methane, and nitrous oxide. So the short and long of it is we can't get enough of the sun's heat back off this earth. How bad is it? In 2007, the UN Climate Panel issued its long-awaited assessment report, its fourth assessment report, 2,500 scientists, 125 countries, across every discipline, 20 years of modeling. The report was dire. I was in Paris. It was published in Paris at that time. President Chirac asked me to come in to address the question, what do we do now from an economic perspective? And I'm going to tell you something. First thing I did is I got up. We had world leaders there. I said, well, I got it wrong for 30 years, which is a long time to get something wrong. I first wrote about climate change in a book some of you old folks remember called Entropy in 1980. We were aware of the crisis. We built a global network in the 80s of environmental activists, NGOs, and scientists, but we continued to underestimate the speed of climate change. We couldn't wrap our mind around the feedback loops. We can't even model the feedback loops. Then when they happen, we say, how did we miss it? That's what's terrifying us. So our scientists say it looks like a 3 degrees Celsius rise in temperature in this century. To put this in perspective for the parents and grandparents here, if we only go up 3 degrees, that takes us back to the temperature on Earth 3 million years ago in the Pliocene, completely different ecosystems. It's all about water, the hydrological cycle. And I wish Al Gore had gone into this in his film. What's terrifying about climate change is the shift in the hydrological cycle. For every one degree that the temperature on the planet goes up, the atmosphere absorbs 7 percent more precipitation from the ground. It sucks it up. That means the entire water cycle of the planet is completely destabilized in a tiny moment of evolutionary history. More floods, more droughts, more tsunamis, more hurricanes, more extreme winter and summer conditions. The whole water cycle shifts. The ecosystems cannot catch up to that change, and that is what's so frightening. And the ecosystems destabilize, then all the species of life in those ecosystems are threatened with extinction. Our scientists tell us we are now in the early stages of the sixth great extinction event of the last 450 million years. We've had five wipeouts. Every time we had a mass extinction, it came quick because the chemistry of the Earth shifts in a moment of time. And it takes about 10 million years to recover the biodiversity we lost. So our scientists model now show uh, we're in the sixth major extinction event. 
On the low end, 25% wipeout, but on the upper end, which is now looking more like what we're going to, 70% extinction of life in the century of some of you and your children. As my wife says, we're walking dead. There's no guarantee that we're going to be here. 99.5% of all the species that have ever lived on this planet have come and gone. The odds are not good. I teach at the Wharton School in the executive ed program. We bring in CEOs from around the world. The first thing I ask them, do you know what the primary economy of the Earth is? And they don't. It's photosynthesis. Now, we human beings, 7 billion in number, only represent one half of 1% one of all the living biomass. We're currently using 31% of all the photosynthetic production of this Earth. That is just not sustainable, and we're going to 9 billion people. Wake up call. Our world leaders in Copenhagen couldn't cut the deal. It was outrageous. It was scandalous. They were all blaming each other. We had a geopolitical nightmare, and it broke apart. Durban broke apart. Rio's not going to be any better. So we've now reached peak globalization for the second industrial revolution. It's an end game. It's going to take place over the next 25 years. We have dirtier fuels, tar sands, shale gas, heavy oil, but that only ups the ante on CO2. And now we have real-time climate change impacting agriculture and infrastructure. So what do we do? We need a new economic vision for the world that's compelling. We need a new economic game plan to accompany it that's deliverable. This vision and game plan has to move as quickly in the developing and emerging countries as in the developed nations. We have to be off carbon in 30 years. So we want to step back and ask the question, how do the great economic revolutions in history occur? Because if we know how they occur, we get a little bit of a road map where we better go here. The great economic revolutions in history occur when two things come together. First, we change the way we organize energy. Now, we've had many varied energy regimes over history. New energy regimes make possible more complex civilizations. They bring more people together. The energy allows us to annihilate time and space, differentiate more skills, integrate people into larger units. But it's the very complexity of new energy regimes that then requires something else, new communication revolutions to manage the new energy regimes. When communication revolutions merge and converge with energy revolutions, it changes the economic paradigm, it changes the political landscape, it changes consciousness. I will not go into the question of the, this narrative over history. There's a book preceding this Third Industrial Revolution book called The Empathic Civilization. It's a 660-page book, a relooking at the narrative of history based on communication energy and how it changes our empathic distress and our social ability. I would urge you to read that book along with this. Let me give you an example of what I mean here, though. 19th century, we went from manual presses, Gutenberg's invention, German invention, to steam power presses, linotype and rotary presses. All of a sudden, we could mass produce print very cheap, low, at high volumes with low transaction costs, like the internet does today. We then introduced public schools in Europe and America. We created a print literate workforce with the communication skills to match and manage a complex coal power steam driven first industrial revolution. An illiterate workforce couldn't have done this. In the 20th century, we had another convergence of communication energy, centralized electricity, and especially the telephone. And then later, radio and television became the communication tools to manage and market a more dispersed auto, oil, and suburban era and a mass consumer society. That second industrial revolution is clearly dying. These energies, fossil fuels, and uranium are getting more and more expensive. They're never going to get cheaper again. The technologies based on them, like the internal combustion engine, are exhausted. And we have an infrastructure made out of carbon that's literally crumbling. It's on life support. We are, however, this morning on the cusp of a new convergence of communication energy, a third industrial revolution. And Germany is leading this third industrial revolution just as it led the second. Let me say it was Daimler-Benz that created the internal combustion engine. And it was Germany that created the Autobahn. Good idea, bad government. <laughs> so what I'm about to outline, I'm going to talk to you about what Germany is doing in each phase of this. It's the economic engine of Europe. It is going to move us into a third industrial revolution. 
but watch Korea, watch Japan and the Pacific, India and Asia. They're going to be right on line with this. We had a very powerful communication revolution in the last 25 years, the personal computer and the Internet. What's interesting about the Internet is the way it's organized. I grew up on centralized communication, top-down, one-to-many, television, radio, newspapers. What's interesting about the Internet is it's organized to be distributed and collaborative. And it doesn't scale top-down. It's lateral power. Now, for my generation, that's an oxymoron. We always believe power is pyramidical. How else could it be administered? But now we have a generation in this room that believes that power is peer-to-peer, side-to-side, lateral power. It changes everything, the whole way we think in every discipline, in every industry, in every sector of society. This Internet revolution, which is distributed and collaborative and scales laterally, is just now beginning to merge in Germany and some other places, Denmark, Netherlands. It's just beginning to merge with a new energy revolution that by nature is distributed energies that have to be organized collaboratively and that scale laterally. It's a perfect fit. What are distributed energies? Let me distinguish them from elite energies, which we're pretty familiar with. Coal, oil, gas, uranium, they're, they're elite energies because uh, they're just not in your backyard. They require huge military investments. I don't have to tell my German friends we had two world wars, one over coal, one over oil. They require huge military investments, huge geopolitical investments, and massive capital to organize them top down. Be clear that these fossil fuel and uranium energies are the most elite energies and require the most centralized administration financially to get them from the wellhead to us of any energies in history, and they're sunsetting. What are distributed energies? Those are energies that are found in every square inch of the world and in everybody's backyard. The sun shines all over this beautiful little planet every day. 45 minutes of sunlight can power the world for a year. The wind blows across this earth 24 hours a day. Underneath the ground, we have a hot geothermal core of energy ready to be converted. In the rural areas, we have agricultural and forestry residue that can be converted overnight to energy. On the coastal areas where a lot of our urban population lives, those ocean tides and waves are coming in, they can create energy every day. Wherever there's small hydro, we have the possibility of electricity. And when we accumulate our garbage, we can bioconvert it anaerobically back to energy overnight. We have enough of these distributed energies to provide for our little species until kingdom comes. The European Union has committed itself to a five-pillar infrastructure for a third industrial revolution. I was privileged to develop this plan with the EU. It was formally endorsed by the European Parliament in May 2007. It's working its way through the European Commission, and Germany is now leading in all five pillars. Pillar one. The EU is committed to 20 percent renewable energy. That happened during Chancellor Merkel's presidency of the Council. And let me say, it happened not only because of the Chancellor, but because my old friend Frank Steinmeier and Sigmar Gabriel joined with her, and Danny Convented and the Greens. You know all these folks. Everyone was on the same page. Everyone is still on the same page, which makes Germany an outlier, but a very good asset at this point, all three parties. Pillar one, 20 percent renewable energy by 2020. That's a commitment across Europe. Every country has to fulfill the mandate. Pillar two, how do we collect distributed energies that are renewable? You know, our first thought was, well, let's go to Italy, Spain, Greece. They got a hell of a lot of sun. Put in some big solar parks, a high voltage line. We'll just ship it out to Europe. The Irish seem to have a, be blessed with a lot of uh, wind power uh, off the coast. We'll put in the big wind parks and ship it to Europe, and the Norwegians have the hydro. We'll concentrate it and send it out. Now, let me say, none of us oppose these more concentrated uses of what are essentially distributed energies. They are essential. They're not sufficient. And we cannot run a continental or a global economy on centralized applications of distributed energies. There's not enough. You can't do it. It cannot be done. And we begin to realize we are using 20th century thinking based on fossil fuels and nuclear, which you have to organize centrally because they're only found in a few places. And we began to ask a simple question several years back. If renewable energies are distributed and found everywhere, why would we only collect them in a few central points? We had to think 21st century. That got us to pillar two. 
buildings. Let me just say on pillar one, lest we think this is academic, Germany announced last August that it had reached the goal of 20% green electricity already. It's heading to 35% green electricity by 2020. And the Financial Times reported last week that 70% of all the new power that came online in all of Europe last year, 70% it's renewable energy. Does anyone think this future is not here? By the way, the leaders in this, Germany and then Italy, interesting enough. So pillar one, renewable energy. Pillar two, how do we collect this distributed energy? I'm sorry, I'm going to need the front seats. Pillar two, buildings. That's how we collect the energy. Buildings use the most energy. They create the most CO2. Parenthetically, the second major cause of climate change, and I always mention this because no one seems to want to talk about it, is beef production and consumption and related animal husbandry. Number three is transport. But not one government leader in 192 countries, including the ones I advise, have made a single statement on number two cause of climate change, even Al Gore. How serious are we here about the future of our species? We're afraid to deal with diet. Number one is buildings. We have 191 million buildings in the European Union, homes, offices, factories. The goal is to convert every building in Europe to your own partial micro power plant, green power plant. So you can collect solar off your roof, vertical wind off the side of your building for energy. You can collect geothermal heat with your heat pump under the ground. You can convert your garbage back to energy the works. The new buildings that are coming up are positive power. Bouygues has the first building up, the great French construction company. Olivier Bouygues showed me the blueprints three years ago. He was a little tentative. They put it up, though. It's right next to the OECD headquarters in Paris. It just came up. It's drop-dead gorgeous. Architecturally, it's so sophisticated, it collects just enough sun to provide all of its power, and then it sends its surplus back to the grid. Pillar two jump starts construction. To convert every building in Europe and the world to your own power plants is going to mean millions and millions of jobs, thousands of small and medium-sized enterprises to convert the entire infrastructure, the habitats of this planet, so everyone has their own personal power plant. This jump starts the economy. Let me use an analogy. 1970, few centralized mainframe computers, companies sharing the information, pretty expensive. A young man, not much same age as the young people here, Steve Jobs, said, I'm going to invent the personal computer. Now 2.3 billion people send their own video, audio, and text to each other, lateral power, organized, distributed, and collaborative, with far more power than all the centralized television networks of the 20th century, and we did this in 25 years. Today we have a few power and utility companies. They own the supply. They control the transmission. But already we have several million facilities in Europe producing their own green electricity. Germany has converted one million buildings in the last six years to partial green power plants. That surprises everybody. And Germany doesn't have a lot of sun. So today we have several million buildings trying to put their energy back to the grid. In 10 years from now, we're going to have tens of millions of buildings producing their own green electricity. In 25 years from now, hundreds of millions. It's following the same cost curve as the shift from mainframe to desktop computers and the cell phones. Costs went down. Moore's Law set in. And now the cell phones are so cheap, they give them away. You buy the service. You can get a small computer for $50 to $100 in the developing world. Similarly, the harvesting technologies for the renewables are going down. Solar is heading to parity in Germany and Europe. Wind is already there. Geothermal is next. And eventually, they're going to be so cheap, they're almost free. And then the energy they harvest is free. The sun off your roof is free. The wind off your wall is free. The geothermal heat under your ground is free. Your garbage is free, converted back to energy. So just as we've democratized information with the Internet, now we're democratizing energy. It has massive implications for society. Pillar three, the tough pillar, how do we store this energy? The sun isn't always shining in Germany. The wind isn't always blowing when you need the electricity. Water tables can be down with drought for hydroelectricity. These are intermittent energies. We have to store them. So 
the European Union is committed to all sorts of storage technologies. We want anything that will work, batteries, flywheels, capacitors, water pumping in Norway. But at the center of the storage network, we've placed hydrogen. It just makes common sense. It's the building block of the universe. It carries other energies. It's modular. So you can put a little hydrogen fuel cell in your home or in a big utility. Batteries can't carry the load. The EU's committed 8 billion euros to a public-private partnership to deploy hydrogen. Here's how it works. You have a small company. You have solar panels on the roof. The sun hits the roof, you generate some electricity. If you have some surplus you don't need, you take that surplus electricity and you put the electricity in water. Remember high school chemistry? I think you slept through this class. High school chemistry, you're in the humanities, right? Not the sciences, all right. High school chemistry, you put the anode and the cathode in the water and the hydrogen comes out of the water into a tank. Then when you don't have the sun shining on your house in Hamburg, Germany, you can just convert that hydrogen back to electricity and engineers, this is a tiny thermodynamic loss on site compared to bringing coal, oil, gas, and uranium at every step of conversion from wellhead to you. When Chancellor Merkel came in to office, I said, I want you to take a gamble here. I want you to put some money in for hydrogen R&D. I gave her a memo. She put $500 million into research. It was a gamble. She's a physicist. She figured it would work. And now hydrogen infrastructure is starting to be tested across Germany. Pillar four. Pillar four is where the internet revolution converges with the new energies to create a powerful nervous system for a new third industrial revolution. We take off-the-shelf internet technology. We take the transmission and power grid of Germany, Europe, and the world, and we convert that electricity grid to a ele green electricity internet that acts exactly like the internet. So when millions of buildings in Germany and Europe are collecting just a little bit of their own energy on site, storing it in hydrogen like we store media and digital. And then if they don't need some of that electricity at any given time of the day in that home office or factory, their software can direct their computer to move that green electricity onto the electricity internet. And they can share from the Irish Sea to the doorsteps of Russia, just like we now create our own information, store it in digital, share it online. Germany is testing the green electricity internet in six regions of Germany this morning. It's amazing. All, for example, in one region, they've got all the appliances connected to software. So we will know what every washing machine is doing in Germany. So if there's too much demand for electricity, not enough supply, we can tell 300,000 washing machines, forget the extra rinse. If you bought the program, you get a credit. It's voluntary. You're now an entrepreneur. You can choose not to be one. They're even testing weather conditions because we can obviously with GPS and with uh, Doppler, we can know what the wind's going to do in two hours from now, what the sun's going to do in six hours from now, or if it's going to rain in 10 hours from now, and they're feeding that information to the grid so you can tell whether you stay on the grid, go off the grid, sell, or buy. Pillar five, last pillar, transport. Electric vehicles are out this year. Fuel cell vehicles are out in 2014. Mass production, done deal. We can plug in our cars, buses, and trucks anywhere into the grid, get green electricity from our buildings. Wherever we travel in Germany, power charging units on every parking meter and really under the ground, too. You go up on the, on the plate, right there at the corner with a street light. You're juiced up in two, two, min two minutes, one minute. Your smart card's in. You move on. You can even sell your electricity back to the grid. You're working. You're, at, you're maybe writing a paper. Your car's sitting out there doing nothing. It's attached to the grid. If the electricity price goes up, your computer will direct your car to sell back to the grid. If 25% of the fleet of Germany at any given time is selling back to the grid, you eliminate every centralized power plant. These five pillars together create a living infrastructure, a mega technology platform for a new economic paradigm. This is power to the people. This is the democratization of energy. This changes the political, social, and cultural political arrangements, power relations in society fundamentally, flattens them. If you know how a communication energy matrix comes together, you can pretty well determine the way power is distributed in any given society in history. Let me say that the music companies did not understand the distributed collaborative nature of the internet revolution. When millions of young people, some of them here in this room, started sharing their music with file sharing and music, the music company thought it was a joke. Then they became terrified. 
Then they went out of business, all in five years. Some of them stayed alive, but barely. The newspapers did not understand the blogosphere, millions of people sharing information, knowledge, videos. These are all amateurs. This will just be a side event. Now the newspapers are going out of business or creating blogs to try to stay in the game. As powerful as the democratization of information was with the Internet, when the Internet then democratizes energy, this is a, this is a sea change. This is a game changer. The reason we can do this now is Grid 2.0. For 30 years, governments say, Mr. Rifkin, how do you run the world on garbage? Windmills, solar, panels. This is soft energy. It's nice, but it's going to be a niche energy. We have to have hard energy, coal, oil, gas, and nuclear. We couldn't answer the question until the late 90s when two researchers in Silicon Valley came up with the idea of connecting thousands and then millions of little desktop computers with software. When you connect them, the distributed power dwarfs centralized supercomputers. We can take grid 2.0 now to the power lines. When millions and millions and millions of us are producing just a little bit of our own energy and sharing whatever little surplus we like, that distributed power wipes out anything you can imagine with little teeny nuclear and coal-fired power plants. There will be an entropy bill, though. It means we have to also have a quality of life that's commensurate with our ability to use this energy that this is sustainable, it's post-carbon. Let me emphasize here, let me talk about Pillar 5, transport. Daimler invented the internal combustion engine on the 125th anniversary of Daimler at the beginning of the Frankfurt Auto Show in September. Uh, Mr. Zessis held an event. He brought 450 guests from around the world. He asked me to do an introduction. You can see this on a YouTube video. I laid out the five pillars. He laid out Daimler's future. He introduced this gorgeous sedan, fuel cell sedan, out in 2014, 750 kilometers with no fill-up. The only exhaust is water and heat. And he said, we're moving from the internal combustion era to the hydrogen era, and he set up an arrangement with Vattel, RWE, Linda AG, and Shell, and they're setting up fuel stations across Germany. So these are the five pillars. Germany's the engine. It's moving across Europe. Smaller countries like the Netherlands and Denmark are moving quickly. Watch Italy but Germany is leading this. I wish I could talk about the new business models, but I don't think we have. I'll try to catch it for a second here. This third industrial revolution creates distributed capitalism. I'm actually a little, uh, that term bothers me a little when I use it um, because it's actually beyond capitalism and socialism. The third industrial revolution requires everyone to be an entrepreneur but it also requires deep collaboration. You have to share energy across continents to make enough load to run a society. You have to have a social market model. But it also creates new business models that are beyond capitalism and socialism. They borrow a little from each. I'll give you an example. We've democratized information. We're democratizing energy. And now we're about to democratize manufacturing. It's called 3D printing. This all goes together. How many know 3D printing? 3D printing, it's a couple years old. There are thousands of companies starting on this, startups. You'll be able to take software code, and with that code, you can create a product, a physical product, in the printer, and it pops right out. So the software allows you to do what we call additive manufacturing. Most all manufacturing traditionally is centralized top-down. You winnow down the material. You lose a lot of it to get the final product. This is additive manufacturing. The software codes it layer by layer so the molten plastic or the metal starts to build it up at each layer, and you use one-tenth of the material, one-tenth of the energy. And if the energy in your small and medium-sized enterprise is on site because you're collecting your sun, your wind, your geothermal, then you run the factory there at a fraction of the cost that you would have with centralized production. Now, how do you market it? The marketing cost in the sec first and second industrial revolution had to be centralized, top-down, and expensive. Radio, television, magazines. Now, with the internet, your marketing cost for that product that came out of your printer is going to be marginally free. How many know the website Etsy, E-T-S-Y? This young man that created it called me six months ago. He was all excited. Dropped out of NYU. His parents must have been pretty upset. He wanted to build furniture in his living room, so he builds all this furniture, and then he can't get it out of the living room because he has nowhere to sell it. So he brings a couple of guys together from NYU, and they create a website. And today, thousands and thousands of small producers of craft and other goods have been connected with millions of consumers who want them 
and there's no price, no cost on the marketing, and the only sale here is when the commission is made, Etsy gets a little teeny percentage of it. So now you can democratize information, democratize energy, democratize manufacturing, democratize the marketing because you don't have the transaction cost, and then if your green logistics is produced locally <laughs> and sold regionally, you have a fraction of the expense. This is a boom for the small and medium-sized enterprises, and that's why there's a lot of excitement in Germany, because it's a powerhouse with SMEs. But there's also a role for Siemens and Bosch and Daimler who are moving to the third industrial revolution very quickly. The large companies will be aggregators, they'll be consultants, they'll play more of the role of collecting and using uh, R&D to help the process along. But this is a flattening of the market. And it actually moves from markets to networks, ownership to access. I can't go into that this morning. You can take a look and take a read in the book. The first and second industrial revolution scale vertically, top down. Because energies, these energies were elite, coal, oil, gas, and uranium, big geopolitical military costs, but huge capital costs to actually process these energies. That meant that the entire economic structure had to be centralized, centralized electricity for communication, and then you had to have centralized factories that could create economies of scale vertically because of the expense of the energy. You with me? And then centralized logistics and supply chains. I went to Wharton in the 1960s as a young student. I learned this is the way you organize vertical economies of scale based on, well, they didn't say that, but based on centralized electricity, centralized energy. The third industrial revolution, from what I've just told you about democratizing information, energy, marketing, and logistics, it doesn't scale vertically. It's distributed and collaborative. It's engaging SMEs and networks. It's lateral power. The third industrial revolution infrastructure likes to run nodally across borders till it reaches the ocean edge. It's going to come in like Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi was an improbable possibility. All of a sudden, people took the junk frequencies at the lower end of the spectrum and they started connecting garage to garage, house to house, building to buildings, and in 10 years we connected the world with Wi-Fi. The third industrial revolution comes in nodally. So when Munich, and Munich's moving very quickly to do this, when Munich becomes involved in renewable energy or any other city, well, let me take Rome. My global policy group did the master plan for Rome and many other cities in the last few years. When Rome creates a five-pillar node for a third industrial revolution, it immediately searches for another node. Because if it has a surplus of green electricity, it wants to sell it to Munich. But if it has a lull and Munich has a surplus, it wants to buy it cheaply back from Munich. So the third industrial revolution is nodal. It comes in city to city, region to region, rural area to rural area. And we have to imagine Europe as thousands and thousands of small nodes and larger nodes who connect and share in geographic spaces just like we do in social spaces on the internet using the similar technologies. The third industrial revolution creates a new politics. It's very strange to watch this unfold. Sometimes I distance myself and watch, why did Chancellor Merkel, Christian Democrat, like this? Why did Zapatero, a socialist, move on this with his administration until he hit that austerity problem? Why in Rome do we have a right-wing mayor, Mr. Alemano, who did this? Why in the UK did David Miliband not want this, but Cameron did? It, there's no way to take a look at this from the old politics. In Germany, Frank Steinmeier, Sigmar Gabriel, Danny Cohn-Bendit, as well as Chancellor Merkel all want this. Some places, they don't. It's because there's a generational shift going with this third industrial revolution, and it's in this room. The young generation of the internet does not think right-left, centralized. They don't think right-left. A young internet generation doesn't think capitalism, socialism, who owns the means of production. I rarely see this discussion on the internet. This is history. This is 20th century thinking. When someone in the internet generation ponders political power, they ask a different question. They ask, does this institution, whether it's a government, a political party, a business, or an educational system, is the power, is the institutional behavior centralized, top-down, patriarchal, closed, and proprietary, 
Or is the institutional power distributed, collaborative, open, transparent, and lateral power? Make sense? That's a different political landscape. That's the landscape of the Occupy movement and the October 15th movement and the Internet movement and the Arab Spring. That's a generational shift. I'm sure you're discussing this here in your business school. Well, I hope you will be in your public policy school and your other schools. It's going to be tough for the older generation, much easier for the younger generation. Now let me get to one last issue with Germany. Right now there's a debate across Europe, can we save the European dream? I've been hammered on this. If you read the Financial Times, I wrote that book, The European Dream, and now the columnists are saying, well, Mr. Rifkin, what happened to the dream? Right now, we're in the midst of a huge debate in Europe about how to save the Eurozone, how to save the Euro, how to save the European experiment. And be clear, the European experiment is the most important political and economic experiment of the last century. Yes, there's going to be discussions of austerity, and what's happening is Germany's at the center of this storm because it has to deal with the austerity issues across Europe. Austerity, yes, but with these conditions. One, do not compromise the European dream, which is quality of life. And that leads to two, do not undermine the social market model because that's the way you develop quality of life. And three, make sure that whatever austerity measures we have do not undermine our sustainable relationship to the biosphere in which we live. Within that context, we can make cuts. You know it and I know it. There can be austerity cuts. Well, let's assume we make the austerity cuts and we engage in the fiscal reforms, the monetary reforms, the banking reforms, the labor reforms. So what? They're essential, but not sufficient. Because even if we do all of that and we're still living in a second industrial revolution that's dying based on energies that have sunsetted, there's no way to grow the economy in an intelligent, sustainable way. So we have to match austerity and these reforms with a powerful third industrial revolution vision and plan. How does this address the next venture in Europe? Europe started around energy. After the war, France and Germany decided we can't fight anymore around energy. And the first thing they did is said, we're going to share the rural valley, the Ruhr Valley. We're going to share the coal and share the steel and create the coal and steel community. Then they said, we've got a new technology, nuclear power, we're going to share that with the Euratom. That led to the common market, the EC, and the EU. It was around sharing energy so there'd be no more wars, collaborative effort. Now, 50 years into the European Union, what is the next stage of European integration? The Chancellor is asking, how do we create a deeper Europe, a more integrated Europe? We have the golden goose. We have to feed the golden goose. And this is what I said to the Chancellor after Fukushima. She asked me to come to Berlin. Some of you saw it. We laid this out. And I said, what you need to do is feed the goose. Here's the goose. You have 500 million consumers in the European Union. You have an additional 500 million consumers in your partnership regions in the Mediterranean and North Africa. You have a billion-person market, potentially the most impressive market of consumers in the world. What has to happen now is we have to carefully, carefully wean off the second industrial revolution infrastructure without allowing it to collapse, but very deliberately and quickly move into the third industrial revolution infrastructure and move this node all across Europe so there are thousands and thousands of nodal infrastructure points that are connected so we can share energy and green electricity across the continent. Then we have to put in a seamless transport grid based on e-mobility and then a seamless communication grid with broadband. So we have one internal infrastructure market that allows one billion people to engage in commerce and trade sustainably for future generations. That is the next stage of the European integration project. The third industrial revolution, I believe, is the vision and plan. If there is a plan B, I have absolutely no idea what it would be. Go back to the old energies. The Chancellor has made a calculated risk. It was a gamble after Fukushima. She said, we're getting out of nuclear. We're moving into this. Now the whole world's wa watching Germany, as you know. Can Germany pull this off? Can Germany be the model for a 21st century third industrial revolution? Everybody is watching this country. You can't fail. Simple as that.
even with a good economic vision, and I think this vision makes sense, as my wife says, it took all of you folks 20 years to come up with these five pillars. It's just common sense. We've got to get off carbon. That's renewable energy. They're everywhere. Two, we have to collect them, and if they're everywhere, collect them in the infrastructure. That's the buildings, because the energy surrounds our infrastructure. Three, we have to store them so that's intermittent. That's hydrogen and other storage. Four, we have to share them across continents because each of us alone don't have enough load. It's only when we share it we can run an economy. That's an energy internet. Five, we have to plug them into transport so we have logistics and mobility. See how simple that sounds? It took us 20 years. It's embarrassing how things emerged, but now at least we have something to make sense in the business community. And now it's up to government, business, and the civil society at every level to move this infrastructure in. But I'm going to say this uh, to you this, uh, this morning. Even with a decent vision and a deliverable plan, it isn't going to work unless, first, we move the developing world as quickly, and second, we shift consciousness. This third industrial revolution can move more quickly in the developing world because there's no infrastructure. Remember, the best we could do with the first and second industrial revolution is provide half the human race with electricity that was reliable. Not very good because it's centralized. We couldn't do it. 23% of the human race this morning has never had electricity. Another 25% of the human race this morning has sporadic, infrequent, unreliable electricity. Centralized use of energy could never have moved for the whole world community. But now with this third industrial revolution, renewable energies are in everyone's backyard, including every local village, every small city, every place in the developing world. And because there's no infrastructure in these communities, they can leapfrog in. This caught us by surprise in the business community with cell phones. We were caught by surprise when all of a sudden in the sub-Sahara, millions of people start getting cell phones. There weren't even any cell towers. And then the same thing happened in India. And then the towers came. It's like an old house versus a new. My wife and I have been, <laughs> oh my God, we've been renovating this old house for 20 years. It is a bottomless and tropic pit. It takes forever. Had we built a new house from scratch, everyone smiling that's been through this trauma in life, if we had built a new house from scratch, much cheaper, much quicker. In November, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization had its biennial conference. I came. We laid this out. We spent a year in preparation. The United Nations has taken up this model with UNIDO. In January, we spent a year with FICI, the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce. I worked with their business community. We developed a plan for India's business community to move into this model quickly. It was announced two weeks ago when we were in Delhi, and we've been meeting with the federal ministers, and India is a perfect choice because it's a democratic economy. Third Industrial Revolution does well in a democratic economy. It does not do well in authoritarian centralized regimes because it's power to the people, if you understand my drift and where I'm heading here. Watch India in Asia. But even with a good game plan, that's deliverable in the developed and developing world, if we don't change consciousness to parallel this shift in the change in technology, I simply don't think we can get there in time. We can't make any mistakes. This is daunting, and we're not going to get there without a shift in consciousness. What's interesting is when new communication energy revolutions converge, they actually change the gestalt and consciousness as well. Forge or hunter societies in history, they had mythological consciousness. An empathic distress, which is the basic human drive we now know, not aggressive predatory behavior. We're the most social creature. Those are secondary drives. Empathic distress only covered the local tribe, blood ties. And every forager hunter had mythological consciousness. When we went to the great hydraulic civilizations in the Middle East, the Indus Valley of India and China, we went to uh, stored sun with agriculture, and we developed writing to organize it, communication. We went to theological consciousness. And empathic distress extended to a larger family, from blood ties to religious ties. All the great religions were formed back then. I'm Jewish, the Abrahamic religions. Buddhism based on script in India. And we extended our empathic distress to these larger units. In the 19th century, first industrial revolution, we shifted to ideological consciousness and a new sense of family, the nation state. Now all Germans think they're Germans. All French think they're French. It's, an, it's, it's a historical fiction. But we create the commemorations and the ceremonies, and now Germans kiss each other on the cheek, but maybe they don't kiss the, 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 uh, the French. The French all think they're brothers and sisters. They extend their empathic distress to the outer boundaries of their new 
communication energy regime, but it doesn't include Germany. You with me? Then we go to ideological consciousness. In the 20th century, second industrial revolution, new energy and communication, we shifted to psychological consciousness. And the empathic distress went to a new fictional family, those of like-minded associational ties. Today, we're on the cusp of this third industrial revolution, and the borders are shifting now to biosphere consciousness. We're not giving up psychological consciousness, or ideological consciousness, or theological consciousness, or even mythological consciousness, but it's like the Russian dolls. The smaller dolls are embedded in the larger doll. We're now realizing that our indivisible community is the biosphere, not the geosphere. How do we shift from geopolitics to biosphere politics? The biosphere is that sheath from the stratosphere to the oceans, where all biochemical and living processes interact to maintain the stability of this living Earth. It's not a metaphor, it's a biochemical system. And now a younger generation is beginning to believe that our community is not just our blood ties or our religious affiliations or our national loyalties, but are beginning to extend empathy beyond blood ties, beyond religious ties, beyond national ties. They're still there. They won't disappear. But we're now encompassing them in one larger reality that we're all actually participants in one indivisible community, the biosphere. That's the beginning of biosphere consciousness. The European Union is the first experiment to try to move us to these broader boundaries. The Third Industrial Revolution favors continental markets, continental political unions, the first one, Europe. The Asian Union is going to follow with the Third Industrial Revolution. They're already beginning to lay down the infrastructure and the continental markets and a continental political union. The African Union is just now starting to move ahead on this, finally, with the Third Industrial Revolution infrastructure the beginning of continental markets, continental political union, the South American Union formed two and a half years ago. We're beginning to shift in a flat lateral way in broadening our sense of community to continents in the world. Unless we think this is academic, consider this. Here in Massachusetts or in Hamburg or in even in countries all over the world, our kids are developing biosphere consciousness, and they've done it in less than 10 years. 10-year-old kids are coming home all over the world, and they're saying to mom and dad, well, why is the television mode on when no one's in that room? Why do we have two cars when we can have one and then have a car share? Where did the, ha where did the hamburger come from on my plate? Let me use this as an analogy. A kid will come home and say, did that hamburger come from a cow that was grazed in a rainforest in Central America? Did they have to destroy the tree canopy for the four-inch soil base to graze that cow? When they destroyed the trees, what happened to all the species of life that rely on that canopy? Did they go extinct? And when they destroyed the trees to graze the cow on that thin soil base, there's no CO2 sink left because the trees aren't there and the temperature of the earth goes up. And if the temperature of the earth goes up, how does that affect a farmer 10,000 miles away because he now has more floods and droughts and can't grow food on his land for his children? They are connecting the dots. This is systemic thinking. They're beginning to realize, the young people, that every single thing all of us do every day has an ecological footprint that affects the well-being of some other family, some other creature, somewhere on this earth. This is biosphere consciousness. We have a generation in this room that's connected on the internet. And what is so interesting about the Arab Spring is those young people had more in common with their Facebook page than their tribal blood loyalties, at least among a small group, you know, that moved to the streets. And so now we're starting to connect at the speed of light. So when there's an earthquake in Haiti and we get the Twitter and YouTube within an hour and we can actually feel like we're in the backyard and these are our brothers and sisters in real time, that's the extension of empathy in real time to our fellow human beings. So now with this third industrial revolution, we have connected ourselves on the internet, but imagine when we connect ourselves in this third industrial revolution node across Germany, Europe, and the world, when each of us is responsible for the node we're in, and we have to steward the energies in our part of the biosphere, but then connect to other nodes to share that energy we begin to realize we are as interconnected in the energy flows of the biosphere as we're connected in the social spaces of the Internet. That's real. 
So, what's the mission? Germany has a big task at hand. It has to move Europe quickly into this third industrial revolution. As I said, I think the other players to watch, watch Korea in the specific and watch Japan in the next year because after Fukushima, the Japanese public wanted the prime minister to quit. He said, I'll only quit if you pass one piece of legislation, then I'll quit. And you know what that legislation was? A feed-in tariff like Germany put in so that you raise the electricity price slightly, that means early adopters can have all that opportunity to convert their buildings to renewable energy and then get premium for sending their electricity to the grid. That was the only thing he wanted passed. Now, the young generation in Japan and the IT industry and the internet industry and the construction industry and the transport industry, they're on fire and they're going to roll right over those power and utility monopolies in Japan. So watch Japan, watch Korea, watch India and in, in Asia, watch potentially Brazil, maybe, in South America. So I'm hopeful. I'm not optimistic, I'm not pessimistic, doesn't do me any good. I'm 67 years old, I've been doing this for 40 years and I've learned something. History is mercurial. Anything can derail this. Bad leadership, unfortunate events, historic moments that we didn't anticipate. But what we need to do, all of you young people here, and not only my German friends in the audience, but my American friends, because we need to move this. Let me say, America's behind here. But what, one thing I know about America, once we get the narrative, we can move very, very quickly. I'm hoping what's happened in Germany will blow back to America because there's a young generation here that's ready for this third industrial revolution. The key is the narrative. The reason Obama failed is he didn't understand the narrative. He wanted a green economy. He poured billions of dollars of stimulus money into a green economy, but he isolated it in sidled pilot projects. He put money to a battery factory here, a fuel cell factory there. He didn't connect it. He didn't understand that the great changes are infrastructure shifts. You have to have a communication energy matrix in place and then the pillars of an infrastructure to go with it. So he literally lost and wasted billions of dollars of our monies. More importantly, now the American people don't believe you can have a green economy. Germany has put all the five pillars together and the communication energy matrix and created 370,000 net jobs just in pillar one and two. So in Germany, you believe this can happen because you put the infrastructure in place. So what we need to do here now is tell the narrative. And here at Harvard, I'll give a mission for you here in the Kennedy School, in the Harvard Business School, in the Architecture School, in all of your departments. Universities here and across the world are beginning to set up sustainability programs, as you know, across disciplines. But most of it's around energy efficiency only. What I would like to see and start it here at Harvard and get universities connected across the United States and Europe to begin moving into this five-pillar nodal infrastructure. The University of La Sapienza in Rome is already setting up all five pillars so they have a working model right there that can show Rome what to do. The Los Angeles Community College System has done the same thing. But it's not just the working model. What I'd like to see here at Harvard is to bring together all of those schools, architecture, engineering, biological sciences, MBA, Kennedy School, and began to create, if you will, a working committee to move this narrative th forward. Then connect up with the other universities, MIT and Tufts and the other schools here and around the country and begin a revolution, a third industrial revolution. The legacy you will leave for your generation, maybe we can move to a post-carbon world, mitigate temperature shift on this planet, save our species, steward our fellow creatures, create a just economy, and allow this planet to reheal over the next several centuries so we can maintain this experiment called life in the universe. So I think that's the dedicated mission. I'm hoping every young person in this room will spend your next 40 years organizing, mobilizing, executing, get us to a post-carbon world, get us to bios for consciousness.
Thank you so much, Mr. Rifkin. Um, we have time for two. We have time for two very short questions, if there are any. Otherwise, Mr. Rifkin agreed that he would be around in the coffee break. Two very short, please be brief. Those two. Uh, good morning. You're Gebler Wagner Solar. I run a solar company here in, in Boston, a German subsidiary, and I studied renewable energies. Uh, I have heard or learned from you today that it takes American thinkers to allow a country like Germany to become energy autark. You and Al Gore, I heard before, you're the second one before Al Gore. Uh, my question for you is, what do you tell the US to do when it takes a fall day and wet snow to take many cities here in the Cambridge area and Boston area off the grid. Thank you. The, what's happened here in this country, California, Oregon, and Washington, they're with us on the European plan. If you go to California, Washington, and Oregon State, it's very similar to what's going on in Europe. Parts of New England as well, and southern Texas from San Antonio to Austin, my group did the master plan for San Antonio, and they're moving it on that part of the grid. Other places, not there yet. We have, because of the politics here, we have a, a big backlash saying climate change is a hoax. Secondly, we have very large energy companies that can finance our elections in Washington. Now, I know because I'm at the table in Brussels, the energy companies are there, but they can't command the game because they can't finance it, literally the elections. So in Europe, it's more of a network government. You have uh, network governance. You have the governments, the NGOs, the regions, the local you, uh, communities, and you have the companies, small, medium, and large. Here, the energy companies can literally draft the legislation in Washington. That's a tough knot to get around. Secondly, with um, the administration, to give you an idea of the problem here, when Mr. Chu, the DOE secretary, wanted to move to the new energies, his idea was to centralize them only so the power and utility companies could keep a control over them. So his idea was to set up big solar and wind parks in the West and put a high voltage line in, make sure everyone's electricity went up around the country, and then provide electricity to the urban areas in the East. Well, guess what? All the Eastern governors got together and said, wait a minute, we're not going to do that. We're going to have our own green electricity across the Northeast so we can create jobs and businesses, and then we'll share surpluses on an energy internet with everyone else. So this is, their, not only are we talking about centralized fossil fuels versus the third industrial revolution, but in the third industrial revolution, whether a country goes centralized or distributed. So it's a very, very significant struggle. There is hope. The West Coast looks good. The Northeast looks possible. And I would say history is not on the side of the second industrial revolution. My own prediction, is the third industrial revolution is going to move very quickly in the next 12 to 18 months all over the world, all over the world. There is no way the U.S. is going to stay behind on this. The business community is going to demand the changes. The civil society is going to force the changes. And I believe we'll see the doors open here. I think Germany is five or six years ahead of everyone else. But I believe this is going to open up. I don't see any way we're going to go back. And the next time we see the collapse of the global economy, people are going to wake up and say, well, maybe the problem is old energies in an old industrial revolution. That's my hope. I think it's going to happen. Someone else? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, yes, I wondered if you're in a position, if Germany's ahead of the game, uh, where do you see Central and Eastern Europe? I live in Prague and am filled with despair that that country is in a position to move forward in this way because of all totalitarian wounds and obstructionist politics. And so on. I'm going to give you a little hope. I just uh, sat down for a long dinner with the mayor of Bratislava. He's, uh, and um, he's a young man who came out of, you may know, came out of the IT industry. And we're talking now about Bratislava joining Vienna for a cross-quarter third industrial revolution node. Last week, I was in, I was in um, Poland. And as you know, Poland's been a little bit of a problem uh, uh, up to now. I got a call four weeks ago from Mr. Pollock, the Deputy Prime Minister, 
formerly twice Prime Minister of Poland, the head of the economy, and he's really kept Poland out of the recession. We have a 4.3 percent growth rate. He said, can you urgently come to Warsaw? We're ready to talk. Last week, we sat down for a three-hour workshop with him hosting with all the federal ministers, laid out the Third Industrial Revolution, had a press conference, said Poland wants to now explore moving into the new business model. Well, it's interesting. 30 percent of their business is with Germany. You with me? So it's about trade, too, not just getting to a post-carbon society. So when you have Daimler, Bosch, Siemens, and all those industries in Germany moving to this no third industrial revolution infrastructure, it behooves Poland to move similarly so its businesses are in line. So what's interesting about this third industrial revolution, it's not a climate change plan. It's not even really an energy plan. It's an economic plan that encompasses and allows us to move toward a post-carbon world much quicker than with all the mandates that you can come up with in places like Durban or Rio. So Poland is now very interested. So I hope that gives you a little hope in Central and Eastern Europe. They don't want to fall behind either. This is very significant what's happened in Poland. One last. I think for time constraints, uh, we have to quit the Q&A right now. <laughs> Mr. Rifkin. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your terrific speech. We're going to postpone everything by 10 minutes. So now the, the next uh, address is going to start at uh, 11 o'clock. Um, thank you so much. Mr. Rifkin agreed to stay around for short questions. Thanks.